everyone. This is Julia with episode number 73 of the Mixology Talk podcast. I don't know about you, but back when I was in college, there were a lot of strange myths going around about, especially about alcohol and cocktails and bartending. And I thought today that maybe it would be a little bit fun to talk about the myths that we have heard and maybe debunk a few. So let's get into it. So over the years, I've come across my fair share of myths that just get perpetuated generation over generation of bartenders. So we thought we'd talk about a few and debunk the ones that we can and leave it as an open discussion for the ones that we can't. Ooh. Yeah. So Mystery. Exactly. So the very first one that I'd like to talk about is this idea about bruising spirits. In particular, on this one, bruising gin. Which makes no sense to me at all. Yeah, so the myth goes, if you shake gin, there's a lot of flavor in gin, it kind of breaks down the compounds, and it turns everything bitter. That's the myth. So if you if you shake gin in a cocktail shaker, it's going, the ice is going to somehow break down the spirit, and then it it turns bitter? Is that... This is literally ridiculous. one of the things that I've heard before. That doesn't make any sense. Like, when I was being trained as a bartender, this is one of the things I was told. Don't shake gin because you'll bruise it. And I asked a question. They told me this. And I was like... Do you think it's just because, like, it's an easier way to tell people never to shake gin? It could be. I mean, it very well could be. Which isn't actually that useful of a rule, if you think about it. Right. So, I mean, if you if you start to think about classic cocktails, like the South Side or any of these other drinks, you know, that have fruit juice, the idea of stirring it just doesn't... It's, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't seem reasonable. So It seems like this just goes back to the same thing we always say, right? If there's fruit juice in your cocktail, shake it. If it's a spirit-focused cocktail, stir it. Right, absolutely. You're not going to bruise anything unless you're like a really ferocious shaker and you send it flying. I don't know. Yeah, and it's I've, possible. I've tried this a couple of times because people, customers have called us, called me out on this. Like, you know you're never supposed to bruise gin. So I'm like, or uh, shake gin because you're going to bruise it. And I'm like, okay, well, how do you know this? Have you actually experimented? And it doesn't seem reasonable. So what I've noticed over years and years of being behind the bar, making aviations and every other cocktail that has gin in it is it doesn't matter. It really doesn't do anything. But it is for spirit, for drinks, just a rule of thumb is you want to stir it. Right, exactly. And you you said this about brown spirits too, right? Like where people can say you can make them go bitter by shaking them. But again, it's it just goes it's not about the spirit at all. It's about the sort of overall composition of the cocktail on whether or not you should shake it. Right, exactly. So if you shake a Manhattan, it's just gonna turn really kind of weird brown color. It's gonna be super murky. Maybe the bitterness you're tasting is like the sadness. It could be of a shake in Manhattan. I will say that it is a very different tasting cocktail too. Some of the really? bitter elements do come out, but this is only with spirit-driven cocktails. So, so it doesn't have anything necessarily to do with the ingredient. It's more this like every time you shake whiskey, you're not going to have this happen. No, 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 no. If if you shake a spirit-forward cocktail, it could be one of the results. Right. You know, and uh, the Manhattan had vermouth in it, so that could be a, a, mm-hmm. a factor in there. And it could be the bitterness of the customer looking at you saying, what are you doing? Right, exactly. So <laughs> it did have kind of a resulting bitter- bittering taste to it, but I wouldn't call it, I don't know, I wouldn't categorize it as bruise. I would just I, say, I'm just gonna, don't do it. I'm going to say this is a myth. I'm going to yeah. call it. I, I really don't think this makes any sense. If anybody out there knows of any studies that can actually prove us otherwise with data or smart people who've done some testing, I would love to read them. I know Chris would love to read them even more than me. So definitely add those to the show notes over at mixologytalk.com slash 73. But otherwise, I'm going to call this one busted. I say, you know, same rule as always. If there's if there's fruit juice, shake it. If it's a spirit forward drink, stir sure. it. Unless you're James Bond, in which case, I don't know what you're thinking. Yeah, exactly. And you should be fine after that. So this is one that does originate in college, and it's it's this, I don't know why this persists, this concept of vodka being made of potatoes. It's like a thing. It's ubiquitous. It's in our culture. I don't get it. I mean, yes, vodka can be made of potatoes, but it can probably also be made of broccoli. It can be made of anything. Vodka is a spirit that can really be made out of anything that you can distill. And nowadays, I'm fairly certain that most of it is made from wheat or sugar beets. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I'd say so. Like like you mentioned, you kind of hit on this, that you can literally make it out of anything. Anything that has carbohydrates or sugars that can be fermented, you could ferment it and then distill it to a high enough level to be considered vodka. Exactly. I mean, I, you can take your, take your unaged whiskey, 
distill it some more, then add some water back to it, and it's going to be pretty close. Yeah, vodka. Right, exactly. exactly. So and I think, yes, you can absolutely have vodka made of potatoes. You can also have vodka made of grapes, sugar beets, sweet potatoes. I think there I think there was a vodka that was mentioned in an earlier episode that was made of milk, right? Yeah, there's one in the UK that's made from cow's milk. Exactly. Sounds gross, but hey, like, yeah. why not? If you can distill it. I'll try it. Exactly. So there's a couple examples of this. If you really want to kind of venture out and try them all next to each other and see if you can taste a a difference. And I will say there are subtle differences between them. With the grape ones, the ones that come to mind are uh, Ciroc and Roth. Those are both grape-based vodkas. We came across one that was sweet potato-based. Oh, yeah. That's made uh, locally here in Northern California. And you know what? You can taste it. Yeah, you can you taste can a little taste bit of the trace elements and in, in a there. good way. It's it's actually really, really flavorful. Yeah, and I, I think, think that was Corvin, if I'm not mistaken. That sounds right. I yeah, think that's Corvin. Right. But, and then uh, the last one, potatoes, they definitely can be in uh, in vodka. Oh, um, absolutely. One in particular is that I've run across that is a really unique style of potato vodka is Carlson's. How is it unique? You can actually, it's really savory and it has a really potato Huh. flavor and essence to it i mean they're doing some really cool stuff i think they're in sweden but they're doing different varieties of potatoes so they'll do a fingerling potato they'll do a purple potato and make different distillates they will also do age age designation vodkas really yeah so this will be like the 2010 fingerling potato vodka that's ridiculous yeah so they're trying to go with this <laughs> like same kind of market that wine does you know based on the growing temperatures and the seasons huh could really have a drastic difference in the overall flavor. That is really interesting, though. And I think it does. You're you're absolutely right. You know, when you're tasting spirits, you can often get that sort of underlying flavor of what it's made from. That's why you'll often see folks using sugarcane in rum-based drinks and things like that, as it really reinforces the flavor of the distillate in, in, in rum. But you just can't make a generalization that all vodka is made from potatoes. It's simply not true anymore. Yeah, there's so. I don't know that it was types. ever true. Quite frankly, I yeah. think I think it, there may have been a time when it was most commonly made of potatoes. I think that day's gone. Yeah, I think so as well. Oh, here's another vodka one that I that cracks me up. More distillation is always better. Yeah, I don't understand that because like if you distill it forever, then you just kind of end up with like medical grade yuck, right? Right, exactly. And I, it's just you're just going to add water back to it to make it into something you can commercially sell. Yeah, no, it's really funny. Like this is one of those marketing ploys that I uh, keep seeing. Is like 37 times distilled. Is it really better than 36? Is what I somebody going to call is you like, out on that? Who's going to actually talk about the quality of the water they use? Oh, that's true. Because yeah. Because a huge percentage of vodka is water. You, you Typically what you'll do, do is, I don't know the exact percentages you might know off the top of your head, but you'll distill your distill it quite to a, quite a high ABV, and then you'll add water again to get it to... To get it down to bottle strength. To bottle strength. Exactly. Right. So a significant component of it is water, but nobody talks about the water, right. which is like... <laughs> You know, there's bad stuff out there. Like, if it was coming from somewhere with awful city water with fluoride and chlorine and all sorts of stuff right. in it, nobody's mentioning that. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, my vodka was distilled 37 times, but I just ran it. The water that I used for it was just Tap. kind of from the stream. Right. Yeah. It was good. <laughs> I grabbed Soft. it out of a lake nearby. I have a well in my backyard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's, there's a factory nearby that's throwing pollutants into the water. But aside from that, everything's fine. Yum, 37 times distilled. Exactly. <laughs> so one more vodka one. And we've got a lot of these about vodka. This one comes from my college days, and I'm not proud of it. It is this ubiquitous rumor that if you buy the cheapest, yuckiest plastic bottle vodka, but you run it through a Brita filter, now it's going to be like top shelf high quality. Well, does that turn it from 37 to 38 times? Oh, or is it like... Does it count as distillation? I don't know. Because I know some of them actually do like... 37 times distilled and five times filtered. I've seen that. <laughs> do you uh, do you add them or multiply them? I, don't, I think they're multiplying effects. I maybe, think just... maybe divided? I don't know. <laughs> How does this work? I this, think the math is beyond us. I think Brita distillation should be a term that we introduce. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so the good news is this one is so ubiquitous that a lot of people have had to actually tried to test it. The bad news is, is nobody's tested it with non-subjective testing. It's always a taste test. And so there's always a little bit of subjectivity there. I found one test where they held up the theory that it tasted better. I found another test where they unanimously preferred the unfiltered vodka. So it really is totally contradictory. 
But the fact of the matter is, there's decent vodka out there for decent prices, so you can probably find better stuff for the same price as your crap vodka plus the price of your Brita filter. So just go buy decent stuff. Yeah, I think that's a, that's the main point. Like, why would it. you why would you buy like a big plastic jug of vodka that tastes terrible? Run it through a Brita filter, just spend a couple extra bucks. And Brita save filters yourself. are expensive. Yeah, they're crazy they're expensive. They're super expensive. So I don't understand how this is going to help anybody. <laughs> uh, you know what though? That's it's. Great you tried, or anybody has tried. It's for science. For science, absolutely. <laughs> I will say that in the past, one person I worked with would run their infusions through a Brita filter. And I don't know if it actually did anything better or worse, but um, I kind of, if I infuse something, I kind of want to have all those compounds in there. So I don't know if I want, you know, to filter anything out. I don't know. I mean, it, at that point, it's just like a very fine strainer, right? Yeah, and they have activated charcoal in there, so it'll help to kind of mellow out some of the, the harder substances. But mm-hmm. once again, if you buy good vodka, then, you know, at yeah. decent uh, decent vodka is not expensive. No, you really don't have to spend a lot of money. And, that's, and I think that's my punchline here, is that you don't have to spend a lot of money to get something that's going to not give you a headache on your second sip. Right. So just do that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And then just don't buy so many Brita filters and you're yeah. going to really come out even. Just use it for water. Hey, there's an idea. <laughs> so this is one that I've I've heard quite a bit. And that is everyone's got their own theory on juicing limes. Juicing lemons, juicing lime, how to extract more juice out of them. The two that are the most common is that you have to roll the limes first or lemons first. Oh, I've seen that where you like roll it on, against a countertop with your hand. Right, exactly. And this is supposed to break up the cells in there and like I mean, all the I mean, in theory, it makes sense. Exactly. It does make sense in theory. And then the other one is heating the limes. Microwave it? In a microwave for like a couple of seconds. Uh, to <laughs> I soften hope you everything don't up. leave it in too long. I can I imagine. Exploding limes. That Actually, would absolutely release a lot of juice. I wonder if that... We're going to have to... You are not using my, oh, mi- come my on. microwave for that. Absolutely. For science. If anybody out there wants to volunteer their microwave, I fully support this. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you can see where I was heading with this. A my, uh, lime in a microwave for like 10 minutes, see what I'm happens. I'm shaking my head right now. Oh, man. Um, I think we all know what would happen. There's got to be a YouTube video on this. We'll have to look it up. We'll have to look it up. If I find a YouTube video on this, I'm going to put it oh, in the show notes. Man, I can't wait. I want to stop right now and look it up. But, nope, nope. Um, <laughs> But yeah, there's a couple theories about it. You know, rolling it and heating it up slightly helps to extract more flavor. I actually tried the heating the lime in a microwave for like five seconds. It gets really kind of bitter and tannic. I wouldn't recommend it. Well, you wouldn't cook lime juice. Like, it changes the flavor. Yeah, and the oils are really important mm-hmm. with any of these fresh squeeze. So by microwaving things, you're just going to start to break down. Yeah. Well, and especially, I think uh, there's a risk as well. Some microwaves are fairly even and some are really not. And you right. may end up with hot spots in your lime and then you've got something weird going on so right, exactly just sounds all bad but yeah this one has been pretty much debunked the general rule of thumb is just keep your limes at room temperature yeah that one makes a lot of sense to me and as far as, far as rolling your limes i did I, I this is driving me crazy we were thinking we were talking about this before we started recording i read somewhere about a study where they took loads and loads of limes and actually did an analysis of whether rolling the lime created more juice I'll be darned if I can find this study. I can't seem to find it anywhere. Yeah, I'm sure um, it was... It might have been in a book I read or something. If I find it, I'll put it in the show notes for sure. But I do remember the punchline, and that is there was no notable difference. Mm-hmm. It really was the same. So save your time. Don't don't You don't need to bother with the step of rolling your limes. Yeah, so I do have my own theory. Uh-oh. Anecdotal data. Actually, I did... Anecdotal data. Now, that is an oxymoron. I know, right? <laughs> so, um... That'd be a good band name. Oh, that is good. Anecdotal data. Yeah, what I wonder what kind of songs we would sing. <laughs> Not um, our band. Nobody wants to hear that. That's true. But when I used to hand squeeze a lot of juice for prep, I would put a slit across the top of it. So imagine cutting a lime in half. You have two faces now, right? Putting a slit down the center of each one. And the reason why this, I believe, gives you more lime juice is that it actually splits the lime skins when you press it down. So you extract a little bit more juice out of them. And this will only work if you're using a lime press, right? Yeah, and, you mar- and you microwave it, and then you roll it in your hands. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, uh, lime press. I haven't really tried it with a hand squeezer. Just the idea of squeezing so many drinks by hand just yeah. gives me carpal tunnel. I'm like squeezing yeah, my really. hand right now. But yeah, we would use a big industrial juice mis- machines with a handle on them. So you felt like it was that much, it was worth the extra step. You got that much more juice out of Yeah, it. I did it for a couple of months. And Are you then sure I that's just not like lazy. a bartender prank that somebody else told you? No, no, no one told me this one. I just tried it on my own. So I guess I pranked myself. <laughs> Maybe so. But yeah, try that. Yeah. And uh, it seemed like it worked a, a 
a little bit more. But Hard to say. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. If anybody else out there has your own tips or tricks, or heck, if you have any pranks that you've pulled on the poor guy who's stuck juicing all the limes, let us know. I love, yeah. I love hearing these stories. And, and of course, I'd love to learn from you if you've if you've found something that works. So uh, what is this? Mixologytalk.com slash 73? Sure. I can never keep track of the numbers anymore. Yeah, I know. It's hard to believe we're that. These are pretty big numbers. Yeah. So I remember uh, back in, I want to say the early 2000s, 2005, 2006, somewhere around there, absinthe became legal in the United States again. And everybody freaked out. And I remember because I was bartending and I was like, oh my God, finally we can get absinthe. And there was only like one company or two companies that you could choose from right. uh, in the area that I was in anyways. And I think it was... I can't remember who it was that brought the first United States absence to market, but um, yeah, he just loved it. Well, but if I remember correctly, um, they did not allow absinthe that was made with wormwood. Is that correct? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's because supposedly wormwood has the substance that causes the hallucination. Right. Now, I did a little bit of digging into this because I don't buy it. There's, <laughs> I'm showing my true colors here. And yes, there is a substance called thujone. I don't know if I'm saying that right. That is a component in wormwood and it can be poisonous. But the amount in absinthe is so low that you die of alcohol poisoning long before you got enough thujone in your body. So really, it's not really applicable. And while we're at it, thujone isn't even actually hallucinogenic, hallucinogenic, so I don't even know why we're talking about it. There's nothing hallucinogenic about absinthe when you actually do the digging. Yeah, you know, one of the things I really want to do, and I need to, I need to put this on my calendar to do, is research absinthe because I am sure the stories behind absinthe Oh, there's some, amazing. there's some seriously colorful stories. This is totally anecdotal and going off my memory. But I seem to recall that the early, early in the 1900s, there was a mass, there was, there was a murder. A, a guy went and murdered his entire family, caused big news headlines. And actually, it was the, part of the reason why absinthe was outlawed all in the US, all across Europe and things like that. Well, when you look into it, it turns out he'd been drinking the stuff for three days straight. So well, he was just really, really drunk. And nobody talks about that. The fact of the matter is absinthe is actually really high proof. It varies. It, it can go, I want to say it's from 55 to, to 75. Yeah, it can get really, really high uh, it, in it alcohol. It can. Percentage. I mean, it, it really puts whiskey to shame when you're looking at, at, at how much alcohol you can find in absinthe, which is fine because typically, traditionally, you would be drinking it out of what's called an absinthe fountain, which I'm not going to go down this road now because there's a lot of, of things that go with the traditions for absinthe. But fact of the matter is it's typically diluted. So if you have it the traditional way and you don't have it in excess, no problem, no harm, no foul, no green fairy. Right. But if you're drinking lots and lots of 75 proof alcohol, I'm not surprised you're seeing things. I remember before the ban got lifted, me and my roommate at the time had a bottle of absinthe that we got really? from a traveler. Um, a traveler. A this traveler is an of the world. Story. I hear uh, some interesting stories on this podcast that I've never heard before. We were actually talking about that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> hey, I never heard that story before. Um, is it because you know I can't yell at you if we're live? That's that's part of it. Um, <laughs> that I just don't remember all the all the uh, stupid stuff I've done in the past. So, uh, you, so you got a <laughs> bottle of absinthe from a quote unquote Traveler. A friend, a friend that went abroad, a and traveler. they brought it back to my my friend. So we had kind of a party, and we started drinking absinthe, and it was such a letdown because we were like, "Oh my god, it's absinthe! Oh my god, it's crazy! We're gonna happened. be we're gonna be tripping out all night." Nothing. Nothing. Yep. I think we got a little bit of a hangover because we had a I'll lot to drink before some, that. I'll bet you. And had then a we had absinthe. It's such a disappointment. But the flavor is really good, and using it in cocktails can be a lot of fun. Oh, absolutely. Sure. It's, I mean, and I think that's the great thing is having it back on the market is bartenders now have that flavor profile to work with again. But I, I wouldn't get too worried about the Green Fairy. I don't think that's real. Right. Absolutely. And there's a lot of better ways to have some really crazy drinking experiences. I remember <laughs> That having might be another podcast episode. <laughs> Fernet. Actually drinking a good amount of Fernet will, for me anyway, it affected me like very, very differently. This is another interesting story I've never heard. Yeah, no, and um, somebody else told me that uh, getting drunk on Jägermeister did a very similar thing for them, huh. where it kind of made things, it's a different kind of Spinny. drunk. It's really different than just getting blasted on like gin or vodka or something like that. It's a very huh. different kind of uh, drinking experience. Huh. Yeah, exactly. Good to know. I yeah. didn't have any One fun of those stories. Other silly things I've done in my past. Quote, unquote, silly. Well, that's a wrap. That is all of the myths that we have. Actually, I think we might have, quote unquote, busted all of them. 
Yeah, I think we uh, at least addressed most of them. At least addressed them, yeah. So if, if we're wrong, let us know. Because we did a little bit of research, but certainly we don't know everything that's out there. So if you have experiences otherwise, we would definitely love to hear it over in the show notes at mixologytalk.com slash 73. And uh, if you have any myths of your own, I would love to hear them. Yeah. There's got to be a lot more out there. I guarantee you there's so many we haven't touched upon. So we could definitely do another episode if we hear a bunch of new ones. So definitely let us know. And otherwise, have a great shift. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Never miss an episode by subscribing in iTunes or YouTube. And as always, check out the show notes by clicking on the right.